Hi everyone, my name is Ike and I work in information services at Mesa County Libraries. I'm a librarian. And today I'm going to be talking about Colero, who was a Ute chief. Colero was an influential leader who was born in about 1813 as a Comanche. As a youth, he was captured by Mohawk Utes and he was raised and lived as a Ute. He died on December 11th, 1888 on the Uinta Reservation in Utah, and his burial took place on December 13th, 1888. I've got a couple slides I want to mention, um, just as images or photographs of Colorado. This first slide is a, a photograph of Colorado from January 1888. The next slide is an image of Colorado taken between 1869 to 1870. You can see that below that image, it actually has him named as Colorado. And Colorado was um, not necessarily an alias, but just another name that he was sometimes called. The next slide shows us a picture including Colorado's wife, Sia, on the left, and she's seated. The next slide is an image of the Colorado family from around 1874. The next slide is continuing. We've got a photograph of a group of Utes um, from sometime in the mid 1870s. These Utes were visiting the Colorado Springs area and we can see that Colorado himself is seated on the front row on the right side of that photograph. Colorado was often mentioned in newspapers from the 1880s, really all across the western states, even as far back or as far away as Georgia and Tennessee. He was also one of the more well-known youths during the 19th century, and his name often appears in books about the history of the Ute people. A woman named Lena Urquhart uh, also wrote a book about Colorado titled Colorado the Angry Chieftain. During Colorado's life, he would have witnessed really a complete change in the Ute life ways. Um, and his ancestral or the Ute's ancestral homeland had been reduced steadily during several treaties. These treaties eventually resulted in three reservations across Colorado and Utah. The next couple slides are actually going to be some maps. This first map is showing us the states of Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. And we've got, the map shows us the distribution of the bands of Utes across those states. And all of these maps came from the book, The Ute Indians of Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, by Virginia McConnell Simmons. In this first map, we can see that the, the, the territory of the Moach Utes was in the section labeled number 12. Basically, it's going to be south central Colorado and then dipping down into north central New Mexico. This next slide is showing us the map, um, showing us the Ute reservations in 1868. Uh, we can see we've got the Uinta Reservation in Utah and then also the Consolidated Colorado Reservations. Moving on to 1873, following the Bruneau Agreement, we can see that we have the, Ute Re the Uinta Reservation in Utah essentially looks the same. However, the Colorado Reservation was quite, quite a bit, was changed quite a bit. Um, we can see that really that lower, almost that entire lower third of the Colorado Reservation was taken away. In the 1882 map, we can see that once again, in the sort of a, a theme, the Colorado Reservation was, was subtracted or decreased in size even more so. We can see that it's very down there in the very lower left-hand corner of the state. 
um, just a tiny sliver of what it had been previously. However, on the opposite side, or I should say on the Utah side of things, the Uinta Reservation actually increased in size by a little bit, where it goes right over to the eastern Utah state line. So that was 1882. In 1895, on this next slide, we can see that really the, the Uinta Reservation in Utah, that's basically the same. In the Colorado reservations, it was actually broken up into two reservations, and we can see that the one actually dips down into very northern, the northern section of New Mexico. So that was how those Ute reservations changed over time. The January 1933 issue of Colorado Magazine described Colorado as being famous for his profound stubbornness and his resistance to the forced removal of the Utes. The idea of him being stubborn and disruptive is commonly depicted in newspaper articles of the time. He's also described as a proud and respected leader, a great warrior, and also as somewhat of a loner. In the Colorado Historic Newspapers collection, the earliest mention of cholera is from April 29, 1873, in the issue of the Denver Daily Times. That article was about a visit that Cholero had made along with President Ulysses Grant, along with the Ute chiefs, including Paya, Washington, Jose Maria, and John in Denver. There's also frequent mention of Cholero visiting the Glenwood Springs area for hunting and also to use the hot springs. On January 4th, 1929, the steamboat pilot described an article published 40 years earlier by the Meeker Herald. The article described Cholero's burial and places the location of his grave as being between Fort Duchesne, Utah and the Ute Agency. After his passing, the newspaper described Cholero as now being a good Indian. The use of the phrase good Indian was also used to describe other Utes who had died. Captain Jack, who was another well-known Ute chief, had been described as being a good Indian after his passing as well. The article described the celebrity status that Colorado had attained in the state of Colorado and that he was also unique in that regard. It mentions that he had been asked to be taken to the banks of the White River where he was laid upon his blankets and then died among the willows. It was believed that cholera had died of pneumonia. On December 13th, 1888, the Denver Post ran an obituary for cholera, and that obituary read as follows. Cholera the Ute is dead. Pneumonia took him to the happy hunting grounds. Protest to the last that he was cheated out of the White River country. A troublesome redskin deaf and overweight. Not exactly complimentary terms to be used in, in an obituary. Between 1859 and 1945, the Colorado Historic Newspaper Collection contains 20,836 results for the keyword search term Utes. The high point is from 1880 when the term Utes appeared 882 times. Other notable years include 1902, when there were 644 mentions, and 1906, when there were 597 mentions. Articles often contained propaganda, which portrayed the Utes as savages, troublemakers, and as being a hindrance to mining. That was a very common theme. From 1895 to 1945, there were close to 66,000 mentions of the, of the term Utes and Savages. In 1902, that keyword search returned 2,127 results, representing a high point. To add a bit of comparison, a keyword search for the terms Utes and Peaceful also showed up over 59,000 times. In this next slide, I've got a chart for both. Um, the chart on the left is for the term Utes and Savages between 1859 and 1945. And the chart on the right 
is for results for the terms Utes and Peaceful. Um, although it can be somewhat misleading when you compare these two search results. It's also interesting to note that sometimes those results for the newspapers would be dealing with sports articles or you know, articles dealing with college sports, as we see in the uh, Rocky Mountain Collegian newspaper on November 16th, 1939. It's actually talking about a, a football game. However, back to the main topic, I think a more complete view of history would include a viewpoint from that of the Utes as opposed to strictly that of the European settlers. An ethnocentric view of the Utes would have likely helped sway public opinion of current events, especially as the Utes didn't have an opportunity to give their viewpoint as far as what was happening to them. It was strictly an Anglo focus. On this next slide, we have um, the October 27, 1880 issue of the Gunnison Democrat. The headline was, the Utes, blessed are the Utes, for they shall eat government rations and torture the whites. The article also describes that their good guardians, the settlers, have stuffed them full of love and rations. It also mentions that the Utes had settled down to peaceful practices after past behaviors of violence. Given the th common theme of propaganda in news articles of the time, I think it's really difficult to accept those articles at face value. Um, a lot of those articles were clearly, I would say, trying to sway the public view or, or portray the Utes in a certain way. And once again, I think it's unfair um, that, that you didn't find those articles as nearly as often, which was representing things or presenting things from the Utes' perspective and what was happening and was continuing to happen to them. All right, so we're going to sort of switch gears and move a little bit away from Colorado we're going to talk a little bit about the town of Olathe, Colorado. Nowadays, we know Olathe as being located between Delta, Colorado, and Montrose, Colorado. One of the most famous things about Olathe is its agricultural industry. In fact, we all, a lot of us know that Olathe is, is famous for its Olathe sweet corn. Olathe wasn't always known as Olathe. Um, the town was first called Cholero, and you'll also see mentions of it being referred to as Brown. There are also references in older newspapers referring to the, the town as Cholero Village. The December 29, 1905 issue of the Montrose Press included a title, or included an article titled, What's in a Name? The following is an excerpt from that article. And got that article, or a section of that article, here on this next slide. The article read, a peculiar condition exists down at Olathe. Years ago, Olathe was called Cholero, after the famous Ute warrior. But Colorado became too tame of a name when the good people down there began to put on airs and count their ducats in four and five figures. The article also makes mention of the fact that the name change had never been officially noted in Montrose County records. Two men by the names of Gaines and Ripley had intended to file an addition to the town of Olathe. And after looking at the records, they were shocked to see that the town of Olathe did not exist. The county records, however, were then shortly changed thereafter to reflect the new name of Olathe. While there was some dispute amongst the town residents about whether it should retain the original name. The article makes mention of the fact that some people believe the name Colorado should be retained by virtue of priority of location and the peaceable and undisputed possession of the name for so many years. 
On the other side of things, others believed that the name cholera had been lost forever. Another name considered for replacement was alfalfa. We know now that the name Olathe was what they chose, and Olathe came from the name, town name Olathe, Kansas. Even, so that article came out in 1905, even as late as 1904, there was mention of cholera residents in the newspapers, such as the Summit County Journal on November 19th, 1904. The issue mentions that Colorado residents, Mrs. Charlotte McDonald and Mrs. Maud Strobridge, had made a trip to Breckenridge, Colorado. It seems that there had been a bit of a lag in the name transition from Colorado to Olathe in the public consciousness. However, that's, that shouldn't be necessarily surprising given that this was much before the time of the internet and emails and social media. Um, you know, news traveled through newspapers. It wasn't always as easy to quickly just update a website and then have that information appear pretty much automatically. Um, I'm sure that a lot of these cases, you know, towns changing names, things like that would have been, it would have taken time for that news to be distributed to everyone. So I would say that this isn't, you know, necessarily unique to this case. During the first half of 1896, there was often a section in the Montrose Enterprise newspaper which contained cholera news items. This next slide is showing us that image of that article from April 11th, 1896. And one of the sort of funny little side notes in that article is reading, only the professional loafer is left to hang around the store. All others are at work. And I'm sure that those early residents of Olathe and Colorado were working extremely hard to make a living um, in a pretty remote settlement at that time. Wilson Rockwell, who has written a number of books about the history of Colorado, he wrote books about you know, the settlements here. He wrote books specifically dealing with the Utes. Um, he was an excellent writer, and his, his books and research is just, I think, really awesome. Um, his books, Uncompagre Frontier, which he wrote first, and then Uncompagre Country, further describe how the town of Colorado had been named. The books mention that Colorado had made a camp with his band of Utes in 1881 prior to the Utes being relocated. A railroad section house along the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad had then been given the name Colorado by the construction crew of that railroad. And that construction crew had heard that Colorado had spent some time in the region. The name of the section house then carried over to the naming of the town. So that town was named Colorado. The section house was, the, was first constructed, it was actually the first building constructed in the settlement, and it also housed the post office in addition to being a flag station for the railroad. In 1883, the post office was moved to a log cabin on the opposite side of the railroad from where the section house was. And we can see a photograph of that post office on this next slide. The third building was a saloon, which was constructed in 1884. The first store was built in 1889 and in 1896, the town received its first train depot, and that train depot had been moved from its previously abandoned location in Dallas, Colorado. And in this next slide, we can see an image, a photograph of that train depot from 1896. According to the book, Colorado Postal History, the post offices, 
The Olathe Post Office was established on June 4th, 1896. It does note that that post office had initially been named Colorado and also then named as Brown. And the name Brown comes from the first postmaster of that post office. His last name was Brown. The naming of the post office was also discussed in an Olathe Criterion article from February 19th, 1960. Growing up in Western Colorado, um, you would often hear terms like uncompagre or tabawatch. Both those are Ute words. Um, there's actually six different geographical features across the state of Colorado that have been named for Colorado. The book Colorado Place Names by William Bright includes a description of the Ute meanings of the following names. Ashihapa River was a Ute word for mossy water. Hovenweep Canyon was a Paiute and Ute word for deserted valley. Achi was named after a Ute chief who had advocated for peaceful relations between the Utes and settlers. Cochitopa, Colorado was a Ute word for buffalo emerging. Ignacio was named for Chief Ignacio of the Utes. And Sawatch, Colorado was an early campsite favored by the Utes and it possibly meant blue earth or water of the blue earth. Toyok is a Ute word meaning all right or possibly okay and it was possibly a substitute for the phrase, thank you. Toyok was the location of the Ute Mountain Sub-Agency, and the word might represent Ute approval of the location. I'm sure that, you know, this instance of Olathe originally being called Colorado or named Colorado is not, is probably not unique to this across the state of Colorado. I'm sure that there are other towns and communities um, or I should say, I'm, I'm, there's a pretty good likelihood that there are other towns and communities that had initially been named, you know, given the name, a, a Ute name or a Ute word, um, and then changed to something uh, more European. I also wanted to include some references, um, but before I do that, um, I want to thank you for um, listening and watching. I hope that this, um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think it's important uh, from a historical standpoint that we do look back at situations like this and compare you know, those, those historical newspapers and look at those and try to look at them from all angles and try to consider you know, whether those newspaper articles were trying to sway public opinion and you know, how exactly they were presenting information. Um, you know, I guess you can say that hindsight's 2020, but I think it's just it's good to be aware of um, the fact that history is not always as one-sided as it might appear. Just want to mention those references: um, "The Utes, a Forgotten People" by Wilson Rockwell, "Colorado Place Names" by William Bright, "Colorado Postal History: The Post Offices" by William Bauer. The Last War Trail by Robert Emmett. The Utes Must Go, American Expansion and the Removal of a People by Peter Decker. Uncompagre Frontier by Wilson Rockwell. And the Ute Indians of Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico by Virginia McConnell Simmons. We have copies of those books at Mesa County Libraries and um, they are all excellent reads. Okay. Thanks again and have a nice day.